It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is Knockers, and I'd like to start in Psalm 27.7. Unless you've been here, you may not even know what a verse like this is about, and that's okay, but if you live, there's a good chance you're going to end up here. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. If you've ever cried to somebody, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it might be somebody breaking up with you, and you're either crying because you're so excited it's over, or um, you're like, please don't do this, you know, you're just overwhelmed. Um, but this is a crying out to him, and you're seeking his face, why? Because he said to seek his face. Uh, I've shared this before, but I've got three daughters, one of them just saying, and there were situations along the way with the girls um, where one of them would be trying to say something to me. I, I can remember to me, maybe to Rebecca as well. And, and they would almost grab you by the face and make sure, you know, Daddy, listen with your, with your eyes. Like, you need to pay attention to me because I've got something to say to you. Matthew 7 and verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. These are boom, 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 you do this, he does this, you do this, he does this. Now you say, well, this is just a big, it's just a big slot machine. I pull the lever and he's going to, you know, genie in the bottle, here we go. The context of scripture is never, I want what I want. And if you chase the seeking verses, what are you after? You're after his face, you're after his heart, you're after his will, you're after him. Um, I, I way more than I want what God wants to give me, and if this is not true always, uh, I just want Him. Uh, one of my one of my wife's love languages is quality time. Um, so she's happy. Um, well, she's extremely happy if I'm with her in a thrift store. So that's but a whole other thing. So then she knows I love her. So, um, so you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean a lot of intense conversation? Does it mean we have to be going somewhere doing something? What that means, I believe, to her is she wants and likes to be with me. I think it's one of God's love languages. And we show up. And usually if we do show up, we want something. And you show up and you go, hey, what's going on? Nothing. Kind of everything. He's God, but everything. Um, so what do you need? I don't really need anything. I just thought we could hang out. We could just like be together. Like be together. So you don't want anything. I got everything I need today. What do you need? 
Why don't you sing to me? What if you gave God a chance to tell you what he'd like? Yeah, remember that song from Sunday two weeks ago? Sing me that one. I love that one, especially when you sing it. What have you got to that? So this word ask, um, the translation of, of these words, and I don't usually get into a bunch of Greek stuff, but this word ask means to ask for with urgency, even to the point of demanding. So this is not a casual, dear God, bless the missionaries in Africa. This is a specific person maybe in Africa, Koke and Nancy and their kids and a situation. And you're like, God, look, I know you do understand, but just in case you don't, you have to do something. And all of these ask and knock and seek, all these verbs are present imperative, means they're commands and they, it's over, it's keep on asking. So what do you want? What do you really want? What do you I'm not going away want? Now you say, well, I don't, I don't know. I think I have something. So let me tell you, let me just give you some advice. You and we do not want anything that he doesn't want and that he doesn't want for us. Okay? You don't want anything to do with that. Even if you think you want it, you gotta, you got to back up and say, Lord, it's you. It is your face. It is your heart. It is you that I want. I want I, you own me. It is, it, it's you that I want to please. It's you that I want to follow. It's you that I want to obey. So I don't want anything you don't want for me. So it's you that I want, and I don't want to ask for something. But if I get clearance and you say to ask, I'm about to wear you out. Because I've been told to do that. And I don't know why it works this way, and I'm telling you straight up, I don't know why he set it up this way. The only thing I can come up with is that he likes to hear from me. And if he gives me a situation where I figure out he wants it and I want it, because he wants it and I want it too, and I'm not going to back off, then I am going to be talking to him all day long because I am going to wear him out. And so now we have communication. Now I'm dependent on him. Jesus taught him to pray. What did he say? Give us this day our daily bread. Nobody prays that. You might pray it like a football team or something, but who's praying for daily bread? We got plenty of bread. We got bread we're throwing out. Right? Who, who prays for, for daily bread? Hungry people. So when you get hungry, you start asking for stuff, like basic stuff. We never get hungry. We eat so much, we don't ever want to eat again sometimes. And yet there are people in the world that they, they hear that prayer and go, okay, so it's okay to ask for daily bread? You go, yeah, okay, well, we need that. Give us this day, daily bread. I got kids, I got a wife, I got a family, I got to feed these people, Lord. You got you to show up. So, so God will allow a situation where if you have a basic need, sooner or later something in your life, and you go, wait, this is important. He goes, okay, finally we identified something. So you're going to ask me about that. Yeah, I'm going to ask you. And you're not going to quit. No, I'm not going to quit. Then now we got somewhere. What if that's a financial issue? What if it's a, a health issue, a job issue, a family issue? You say, well, I don't want problems. Somehow God uses our circumstances to get us to him. And if, there's no, if, if we're not wise enough to go to him when there's nothing, then he says, okay, well, I got to get you here somehow, so here we go. Here's your, here's your test. Now are you going to talk to me? And now we got something to talk to him about. So this asking urgency, even to the point of demanding. This one commentary said to ask means to call on for an answer, which indicates that we believe there is someone, our father, listening. So if you don't go in faith and you don't think he's going to do anything, why are you even going? But if you believe he, he can and he will, then you will. The next word is seek. Okay, now listen to this. So if you've been just blowing through your Bible reading it, listen to what these words mean. Seek. To attempt to learn something by careful in investigation or searching, 
to desire to have or experience something or to try to obtain something from someone. So this is like, we're going looking for this. This is not, hey, did you see my whatever? Um, like, no. We're finding this. And we're going to keep on seeking, keep on finding all day long, every day, until we find this. So that's seek. Now let's get to the word knock. This means to rap at a door for entrance and thus implies an even greater or more repetitive intensity than either asking or seeking. Okay, so you've asked for something, now you're looking for something, and now you're like, okay, we're coming in. Short of coming in, we're going to knock on this door until something happens. So what are you asking him for? And did you just kind of say, hey, by the way, if you can do something about this situation, good. If not, no, don't, no problem. I know you're busy. So it's not, now you know, forget about it. Where are you asking relentlessly? Where are you looking like you're going to tear the place apart? Where are you banging on a door and you're saying, I am not going away? John 15, verse 7, and this is back to being connected with him. If you abide in me, in other words, you are connected to me like a, like a branch on a vine, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, how does that work? You're so connected to him, you don't even desire something he doesn't desire because you want what he wants. Let me tell you, give me, give me some great advice. This will save you a little bit of time in prayer. Um, so I know that Jesus is with the Father, making intercession, you know, all the time, praying, 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 praying. So if I get to an impasse, I say, look, you guys are God. You know what's best for me. You talk amongst yourselves, and whatever you come back with, I'll do. Right? Well, what is he going to come back with? I don't care. What if it's suffering? Hey, if that's what they decide is best for me, that's what I want. Is it, can you do that? Don't answer that quick. Because most, a lot of Christians I meet, they are not interested in the will of God. <laughs> Until their own stupidity gets them to a place where they go, uncle, okay, I'll do what you say, God. I tap out, okay, now. But then you've blown up how much of your life getting there. Stubborn, stubborn, oh. I'm going to do it my way. I can do it by myself. Acts chapter 12. So here's a, this is a real life, not story, parable. This is a real thing that happened. We'll do this quick and then we're almost done. So Peter has recovered from his denials. I love you, I love you, I love you. You know I love you, Lord. And he's, he's back. Verse 1, now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. So he gets Peter arrested, hadn't killed him yet. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers. So why are we so nervous about this guy? Because the guy he's following, we tried to lock him up in a tomb dead, and that did not work out so well. Four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but look at this next phrase. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So what does that mean? Somewhere a group of people is pounding, pounding. Praying, praying, praying for Peter's release. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. So he's asleep, and he's chained to two guys, one on each side, it looks like. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. We're, we're out of here. This is crazy stuff. How does this happen? 
You don't have stuff like this happening in this story without the people in constant prayer. Now you say, well, why didn't God just do it? I, I could be sleeping now. I don't need to be praying all night for something gonna, he could do without that. Gird yourself, follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel, was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Thought, oh, I'm having a dream, I'm getting out of prison, and then he like, oh, this is real. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. You're good to go, I'm out of here. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocks at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. Like, well, let me in. Don't go tell everybody I'm here without letting me in. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's an angel. Now, this is what's interesting about human nature. That what are they doing? Constant prayer that this would happen. And then God answers your prayer. You go, oh, that couldn't be that. <laughs> ah, it's just an angel. It's not Peter. Because God couldn't possibly be doing what we're asking him to do. When are we going to be, stop being shocked by God answering our prayers? If you're going to pound and pound and pound and ask and ask and ask and seek and seek and seek and knock and knock and knock, and then he comes through, you go, well, it's about time. I mean, thanks and everything, but what took so long? Now, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now, let me tell you what I believe about prayer. I'm not good at it. I got a little brother who, if you want to learn how to do it, he's a pounder. And actually, it's a little embarrassing for me because he is such a pounder. And I've had things happen in my life that are traceable directly to my mama, who is in heaven now, and her prayers are still getting answered into my little brother. And when he gets an answer on my behalf, you would think it had happened to him. Because that's how hard he pounded. You say, well, I don't really get much from God, just kind of the basics. You've asked for Jack, probably. You say, well, I asked, how long? Continually, daily? Did you give up? Did you lose heart? I'm not saying that's not a thing. Can you get back to it? Because either God can do it or he can't. And if he can't, we're all you know what. In big trouble. I'm sorry, I need to fill in the gaps. <sighs> so you'll know what you really want by what you're asking for, what you're seeking for, and what doors you're knocking on. And for some people, when it doesn't work out, despair sets in. <laughs> and, and there you have it. There you have it. <laughs> hey, it's only going to get worse, dude, so I wish I could. Seriously. You think being stuck in church is hard. Whew.
Okay, so I, I had some more, but let me just end with this story. Um, God worked it out where my wife and I could buy a house. We ended up in a title office. It took a lot of praying, a lot of stuff that had to happen, miraculous stuff for this to happen. So we get to the title company, and the guy that we're buying the house from I've never met, he's upset about something. He's about to walk. I had to talk, this man, I just met him, had to talk him off the ledge, get him in the office, sign the papers. He leaves. So my wife and I go in to close that afternoon, and that morning, usually before I leave, it hasn't always been this way, but we pray together, and, um, and I'll usually say something like, Lord, use us today, right? So if you pray something like that, you've got to be paying attention. So we go in for the closing, and it took four hours. We were in that office for four hours. Delay, the title company, the, the underwriters, just problems back and forth. So the 75-year-old man who owns his title company sold it to Warren Buffett, I think. And, but he's there today, and he's closing our deal. So he's coming in and out. Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? And somewhere in the conversation, he said something about a forwarding address. So he walks back out. Rebecca's on the couch. I'm here in his lobby, and he's across. He walks in. And I said, hey, you said something earlier about a forwarding address. He said, I did? I said, yeah. Do you have a forwarding address? He said, what do you mean? I said, sit down and I'll tell you. I said, if you drop dead sitting in that chair, do you have a forwarding address? Would you make heaven? He said, yeah, yeah I think so. I said, well, why? He said, well, I've helped a lot of people. And, um, you know, I'm a person of character and integrity and went all that. I said, dude, I don't question any of that, just being interacting with you today. But I said, somebody's probably never explained to you that none of that's going to work because that's not how you get in. And within seven minutes, that 75-year-old man who didn't know jack about Jesus held my hand and whispered the most sincere prayer and became a Christian and stood up, gave me a hug, and he'll never be the same. Now you say, well, how does that happen to you? Because there's a lot of stuff I'm not doing but one thing I am trying to do is to make sure my radar is on. And I'm listening for opportunity. Now, if I had gone in there and say, Lord, is there anybody here? Um, one of his assistants was walking through when this was going down and came back later. And she said, thank you for your conversation. And I know what just happened to my boss. Now, if you ain't asking, you're probably not receiving. If you're not seeking, you're probably not finding. And if you ain't knocking, nobody's coming to the door. Right? So if you want to see something happen, you got to say, okay, Lord, game on. And you got you to gotta pound. You got to keep asking. You got to be insolent almost. You got to say, look, you don't understand. You're going to do something about this. You say, well, who would do that? I don't know. How desperate are we? What you got? Now you say, well, what if he doesn't come through? Then you yield. You ask, you seek, you pound, and then let him decide. And then you say, well, apparently that's your answer. I'll be okay with that. Because you want him more than you want what he can do for you. Now, the last thing is to all the people who knock, the knockers that knock this and say, oh, you people are crazy. So tell me about your great life and all the joy and all the peace and all the love and all the forgiveness and all the assurance that when you drop dead, you're going to be in heaven with God because you got his answer, not your own. You better get you an answer that works for him, not for you. And his answer is Jesus who died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. He did not say, I am a way, a truth, or a life. As my mama would say, you got to get you some Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, for your work. 
and Lord Jesus for your life. And uh, whatever's going on in this room or beyond, especially with people who don't know you personally, and they know as sure as they're breathing that you are speaking to them, whether they hear a voice or not, they sense your presence and they know that you are asking them to respond. You are seeking them to save them. You are knocking on the doors that were of their heart and saying, it's me. And they got to make a decision and you will not kick the door of their heart down. But I pray that people today would exercise the faith that you give them and say, God, I can't tell you no anymore. I got to say yes. I understand now that I'm a sinner and that Jesus died for my sins, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead to give me eternal life, abundant life, forgiveness of sins, package deal, everything, free gift. I'm in. Come live in me right now. Save me. Help me, God. Thank you for being patient with me, for sending people to talk to me. And that I'm still alive when this happens, so there's tremendous hope. I am your child now. Show me how to live, how to seek you, and seek what you want me to seek. Thank you for changing my life, my eternal life, and uh, for loving me. And Father, for believers in this room or beyond, and there is no asking, seeking, or knocking because there's no issues. And there, there should be lots of issues, Lord. We're surrounded with people in pain. And maybe we don't have a lot of stuff ourselves that we need, but there are people who need us to need you and be about interceding for them. Uh, Father, give us a love for you like we have for no one, no thing, no place that we'd be more excited about you than even seeing heaven, as cool as that'll be. Because there's nothing better anywhere than you and your face and your presence. And better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. So we love you. It doesn't always look like it, Lord. but you also know our hearts. And we appreciate you because you're the best. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.